As a child, my favorite movie was a Disney film, The Swiss Family Robinson. The story is about a family who gets shipwrecked on a South Seas island. With little hope of being rescued, they make the most of their situation and they create a tropical paradise. They build an elaborate tree house. They invent a system for running water. They add many other conveniences to their lives. After a tangle with pirates, the Robinson family lives happily ever after. As a kid, I would watch that movie and I would imagine myself marooned on an exotic island. Swims in the lagoon. Life in the tree hut. What an easygoing, carefree kind of life. In a pristine, unspoiled garden Shangri-La. You know, even as an adult, it doesn't sound so bad, does it? <laughs> no more eight to fives, no more bills and bosses, no more car repairs and traffic snarls, no more income tax and corrupt politicians. Are you interested? No more deadbolts and burglar alarms, no more war and crime. Movies like The Swiss Family Robinson are popular because they play on a deep seated longing in every human heart. C.S. Lewis once observed, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. You see, here's the truth. God made you and I for the garden. Adam and Eve began life in a garden paradise. Sin got them evicted. But ever since, humans have had a desire to return to that garden. Whether we realize it or not, we long for the garden. And in all we do, we are attempting to return. Right now, it is a jungle out there. Our world is chaotic. It's out of control. But when the king of the jungle returns and takes possession, he's going to reign and rule over this earth. He's going to tame the beasts and transform the jungle into a luscious garden. One day, yet future... God will fulfill our deep longing and return mankind to the garden from which we fell. See, the earth is due for an extreme makeover. God will repair the damage caused by sin and its judgment, and he'll restore this fallen planet to a paradise. We call it the kingdom age, and it is the theme of Revelation chapter 20. And God begins by ridding us of our arch enemies, our arch nemesis. The Apostle John writes, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. At the end of chapter 19, John is near Jerusalem. He has provided us a play-by-play -play of the mother of all battles. The nations rallied to Armageddon to fight against the Christ. But Jesus returns despite their opposition with his breath and with his brightness, he kills all of his enemies. And there are leaders who orchestrate the revolt. The Antichrist and the false prophet are the chief culprits. They order the execution of everyone who worships Jesus and refuses their mark. Chapter 19 forecasts their capture and their punishment in the lake of fire. But the real ringleader, the mastermind behind the rebellion is the devil himself. And now in chapter 20, God sends an angel with a chain to incarcerate Satan. You see, the Bible teaches that there are two spiritual places of punishment. One temporary, the other permanent. Hades is where unbelievers are today. It does have the characteristics of fire and brimstone, but it's interim. Whereas the lake of fire is eternal. And according to verse 14, in the end, Hades is cast into the lake of fire. 
At the close of chapter 19, the devil's two stooges, the beast and the false prophet, they enter their eternal torture. They're cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Yet here, Satan is held over in Hades, or in the bottomless pit, he's chained in hell's holding cell. And at the end of verse 3, John explains why. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Evidently, God isn't through with Satan. He still has a use for him. Verse 8 will explain his final purpose. Yet this brings up an interesting sidebar. Satan's existence, even his mischief, has always been at God's allowance. Not that God approves of the devil's specific acts. He doesn't. Far from it. The evil that Satan authors and the pain that it causes grieves God's heart. Nevertheless, God permits Satan some latitude. And God uses the trials and the temptation that Satan stirs up to strengthen our faith. He uses what was meant for evil and turns it into good. You see, temptation has no real teeth unless there's a tempter. And so at the end of the age, Satan must be released for a little while. For the same reason he wreaks havoc today, he'll test the faith of mankind. Notice also the duration here of Satan's incarceration. A thousand years. In Latin, it's the term millennium. And this is why you'll hear terms like the millennial reign of Christ, or the millennial kingdom, or just millennium. Again, in Revelation 19, Jesus returns to destroy the armies who oppose him. The first word in chapter 20, then implies that what follows is now chronological. Here's what comes next. In chapter 20, Satan is chained and Jesus will reign. And it will last, both will last, for a thousand years. After his second coming, Jesus sets up a kingdom on earth that will reign and rule this universe for a millennium. And Jesus won't just rule by himself. John writes in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. The army that rode with Jesus in chapter 19 from heaven now helps him rule on earth. Which includes, believe it or not, you and me, the church. But not just the church. For then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. The believers martyred in the tribulation will also serve in Jesus' administration. They were mocked and martyred for him. Now they'll sit on thrones and help Jesus rule a world made new. And then verse 4 tells us, And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. You remember the first message that Jesus preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came to establish God's kingdom on earth. Yet in Jesus' day, in fact, even today, no one is able to point to God's kingdom on a map. His reign has no borders. It has no buildings. It's an invisible spiritual kingdom. His reign is known only in the hearts of believers. Jesus said as much in Luke chapter 17, verse 20. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, that is with fanfare or with outward demonstration. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And yet still, the Old Testament is packed with prophecies of a coming king who will sit on an earthly throne, who will rule visibly and tangibly over a geographic kingdom. You remember 2 Samuel chapter 7 tells us that a descendant of David from Israel's throne will rule the world. This is the prophecy the angel quoted to the virgin named Mary when she discovered that she was with child. He said, he will be great. And will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
You see, throughout the Old Testament, it predicts that God will put an end to the governments of man. And he will establish a physical, political kingdom on planet Earth. His throne will be in Jerusalem. All the world will come and bow before him. He'll rule this earth with a rod of iron. Jesus will be the police. And the fulfillment of these promises occurs here in Revelation chapters 19 and 20. You remember in his model prayer, Jesus told us to pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now here in chapter 20 at Jesus' second coming, this prayer is finally and fully answered. The kingdom has come. Imagine Jesus' inauguration day. He's in Jerusalem. He's on the Temple Mount. He'll address throngs of people who will come from all across the planet. He'll articulate the goals of his new administration. His first term, he reigns spiritually in our hearts. But now in his second term, he will rule legally and physically and corporally. On the cross, Jesus redeemed or purchased planet earth. Here he returns to take possession. One day soon, our world will be under new management. Revelation 20 provides us only the duration of Jesus' kingdom. A thousand years. But there are a host of other Old Testament prophecies that foresee many other details of this kingdom. We're told of the quality of life we'll enjoy. The changes in the earth's ecosystem. Even the lifestyle of folks in the kingdom age. You remember one of the plagues of the tribulation is the poisoning of the waters? We saw it several times. Well, in Ezekiel 47 verses 8 and 9, it describes how the earth's waters will be healed and rejuvenated when Jesus returns. Isaiah 30 verses 23 through 26 tell us that there will be long periods of sunshine to revitalize the planet's vegetation. Under Jesus' administration, the earth will be restored to the garden paradise that it once was. We'll live in Eden again. Isaiah 11 tells us how God's kingdom will even impact the animal kingdom. He'll resolve the hostility that currently exists between animals, even between man and the animals. Verse 6 tells us of Isaiah 11, the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. Natural-born predators will no longer exist. God will alter the food chain. Animals will no longer be carnivores. Imagine bulldogs won't be at odds with gators. And yellow jackets won't be trying to sting bulldogs anymore. Isaiah 11 implies that God will remove the fear that protects humans from animals today and vice versa. Verse 8 tells us, The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole and the winged child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Mom, can you imagine your baby's favorite pet will be a copperhead? Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 says that there'll be no birth defects, no Down syndrome or cleft palates or spina bifida. Isaiah 65, verse 20 comments on the longer lifespans that man will enjoy. A man 100 years old will be considered a child, we're told. You know, the Bible tells us that before Noah's flood, men lived to old ages, 600, 700, 900 years old. The phenomena of aging is a mystery. Still today, we really don't know what triggers the aging process. Whatever it is, Jesus will lift it in the kingdom age. You know, in Romans chapter 8, we're told that today, creation groans as it awaits its redemption. You know, Julie Andrews used to sing, The hills are alive with the sound of music. But you know they play in a minor key. Creation groans over man's fall. When mankind sinned, he threw a wrench into the gears of life. A capriciousness appeared within nature. Today the gentle rain that waters your lawn can also flood your house. The breeze that lifts a kite can also tear your roof off. After the fall, twisters and hurricanes went on a crime spree. Random acts of violence. Nature went nuts. Today, Mother Nature has a terrible case of PMS. In a fallen world, nature is now a mixture of beauty and brutality. You know, every time I hear a 
tree creak. Every time I hear a dog howl, I wonder if they're not expressing their angst over the conditions that they're forced to endure in a sin-harmed world. And yet one day, the curse of sin will be lifted. When Jesus reigns over planet earth, the natural order will be restored to its former and perfect and peaceful state. What a day that'll be. And yet the greatest benefit of living in the kingdom age will be the unlimited access we'll all have to Jesus. Isaiah 2 verses 2 through 4 describes how people will flow to the king there in Jerusalem. And Jesus will teach us his ways. Isaiah 2 verse 4 tells us, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Under the influence of King Jesus, this war-torn world will finally know peace. And peace won't just be global, it'll be local. In the millennium, there'll be no deadbolts, no security systems. Crime will be reduced to a minimum, and there'll be no Satan. Glad to be rid of that guy. He'll be chained for a thousand years. Jesus will enforce what's right, and he will punish what's evil. And realize during this millennial kingdom of Christ, a strange mixture of people will occupy planet earth. Mortal men will be living alongside resurrected believers. There'll be humans who survive the tribulation. People born in the millennium will continue to marry and give birth afterwards, after it's begun. With improved conditions and with longer lifespans, a population explosion will occur. The survivors And their offspring will retain a sin nature. And even without the devil's influence, from time to time, they'll need the Lord's correction. And they'll be saved the same way that we've been, by grace through faith. But along with the earth's population of mortals, the church, along with the Old Testament and tribulation saints, will also live on planet earth. After we descend with Jesus at his second coming, we'll hang out and we'll help him rule. The New Testament teaches us that. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 tells us, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2 asks, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Of course they will. Think of the lessons that we'll be able to teach mortals in the kingdom age. We're the ones that have experienced the trials and the tears and all of the heartaches and the sufferings. And think of what we've learned of the effects of sin and our need for faith. When people living in God's kingdom need to be reminded why it's wise to obey the Lord, we'll have firsthand knowledge that we can share with them. Remember what Jesus said to his faithful servant in Luke chapter 19? Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. See, authority and position in God's kingdom are one of the rewards that we receive for our current faithfulness. Hey, I'm serving the Lord right now, and I want to do a good job of it, hoping that I'll get assigned a few tropical islands to rule over in the kingdom age. I'm hoping for Hawaii and maybe Tahiti. That'll be my jurisdiction. In the millennial kingdom, we'll live among the mortals on earth. But according to 1 Corinthians 15, by this point, we'll have immortal, incorruptible bodies ourselves. At the rapture, we'll receive resurrected bodies. Which means that our bodies will have the same capacities that Jesus had after his resurrection. You recall how Jesus would pop in and out on his disciples. His body wasn't confined materially or spatially. He was able to dematerialize and then reappear across space. The disciples thought it was a ghost until they touched him, until they felt his scars, the marks of his crucifixion. And we'll have the same type of resurrected body. I like to say we'll travel at the speed of want. Desire to go to Hawaii for the day, presto, you're there. Can't wait. As we talk about this future kingdom, you should know Not all Bible teachers agree with its literalness. Some Christians teach what's called amillennialism, 
or that there is no millennium. A millennialism assumes that the thousand-year reign of Christ is merely symbolic of the church age, and that one day Jesus will return just to wrap it all up. That's how it will conclude. Other people advocate post-millennialism, that Jesus returns only after mankind brings about a golden age on earth. The job of the church then is to create a utopian society that ushers in the second coming of Jesus. One current form of post-millennialism is what's called kingdom now theology. Rather than expect Jesus to return one day to set all things right, Christians are encouraged to take over earthly institutions now. Christianize society and the government. Create a political, social kingdom here and now. Yet this was the mistake first century Jews made when they tried to fashion Jesus into a political Messiah. You remember he refused to cooperate. His earthly kingdom is still future. Today his kingdom is spiritual. A major problem with both post and amillennialism is if the church is God's kingdom and we're currently in the thousand year reign of Christ, which they insist that it is, well then why isn't Satan bound? Or if he is bound, God's giving him a pretty long leash. Take one look at the filth on the internet or the violence in our streets. Hey, if we're currently in the kingdom age, then Satan must be on a long cord. For me, amillennialism and postmillennialism fall flat on two counts. First, they put too much emphasis on man's work and man's wisdom. If humans can solve the dilemmas facing our planet, then please do so. But the problem is their inability proves the ultimate answers are with God, not with man. And second, these schools of interpretation take the unfulfilled promises that God made to Israel and they apply them to the church. And to me, this denies the Bible's literalness. God's Old Testament promises to Israel are both factual and they're actual. And this is why I believe in premillennialism, that the Bible teaches Jesus will literally and physically return to planet earth. He'll usher in God's glorious kingdom all by himself. He'll reign from a throne for a thousand years. He'll restore all that sin has damaged and in the process fulfill every single promise that God has made to the nation of Israel. Doesn't that sound like our God? Well, back to our text, verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now as John does here in his gospel, John chapter 5, Jesus spoke of two resurrections. Jesus said, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Believers are raised to life, and unbelievers are judged. And both resurrections are found here in Revelation 20. What Jesus doesn't mention in John 5 is that a thousand years separates those two resurrections. And the first resurrection occurs in three waves. It began the very first Easter morning. That's why the New Testament calls Jesus the first fruits of the resurrection. Our Lord was the first of the first to overcome death, never to die again. Then the church will join in his resurrection at the rapture. We too will be given eternal bodies. Followed by the Old Testament believers and the tribulation martyrs who will join at the end of the age. This is all the first resurrection. While at the second resurrection, we're told here, the rest of the dead are resurrected as the thousand years ends. Jesus said back in John chapter 5, God will resurrect these unbelievers to condemnation. We see this happen here in verse 11. At the great white throne of judgment, the bottomless pit empties out. And the rest of the dead, as he calls them, appear before their maker to receive their eternal sentence. Here's the moral of the story. Be part of the first resurrection, not a member of the second. For we're told in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. 
Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. In verse 7, the plot thickens. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And it's not difficult to guess what Satan does, is it? Remember now, Satan has been chained for a thousand years. He's had time to take some personal inventory. He's thought it through. He's considered his mistakes. If he ever wanted to turn over a new leaf, this is it. But no, not him. The moment he's released, he returns to his rebellion and his lies. Like a criminal rebuffing rehabilitation. As soon as he hits the streets again, he's out for revenge. Satan goes to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are players in an earlier war discussed in Ezekiel chapter 39. And he comes to Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. You know, the current conflict we see in the Middle East between Israel and Iran, I believe, may be the early stages of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Only time will tell. But at the end of the millennium, they'll have a second act. Gog and Magog. Satan is loose to stir up old allies for one final revolt against their creator. Did you hear about the devout Christian lady who was dirt poor? A poor gal, she lived from hand to mouth. Yet she always trusted God for all of her needs. And the Lord always supplied. Sometimes at the, at the nick of time, but the Lord always was faithful. Of course, her atheist neighbor couldn't figure her out. If God really existed, well, why was she always in need? One day, he overheard her desperate prayer. Lord, Lord, please, I'm so hungry. Please provide me some food. The atheist decided to teach the woman a lesson. So he went to the grocery store, loaded up several bags of food, set them on her doorstep, and then rang the doorbell, hid in the bushes. As soon as she opened the door... She saw the food and she shouted, praise the Lord. God heard my prayer. That's when the atheist, he jumped out of the bushes and he scoffed at the lady. He said, God, I didn't bring you those groceries. I did. The woman answered, praise the Lord. God heard my prayer and sent the devil to make the delivery. <laughs> you know, Martin Luther once described Satan as God's ape. God's monkey. Like the organ grinder's monkey. The devil exists for the master's purposes. God is in control. Even Satan's rebellion plays into God's hands. He is a puppet on God's string. Think of the cross. Well, I'm sure Satan relished the pain he inflicted on Jesus. The beating and the nails and the rejection. And yet it's now by his stripes that we are healed. He's bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. God turned the tables on Satan. He was rejected so we could be accepted. At the cross, Satan played right into God's hands. And here's another example of how he unwittingly serves God's purposes. You know, for the last several decades, the great debate in psychology has been nature or nurture. Which is the greater determinator of human behavior? Is our corruption, is our evil the result of a genetic defect? Or is it the result of a deficient environment? If my problem is me, then I have nobody to blame but myself. But if it's in my environment, then I can blame everyone and everybody. This is why our culture says the problem is nurture. I'm a sinner because I had bad parents, or I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, or I had a poor education, or I fell into it with evil friends, or I couldn't find a job. Excuses, excuses, excuses. You hear them all the time. But at the end of the thousand years, God steps into the debate. He ensures that no one walks off into eternity in hell thinking that they have a legitimate excuse. At this point, for a thousand years, think about it, mankind will have existed in a perfect environment. 
Jesus is set on the throne. He's occupied the place of authority. The world has been made brand new. Peace and prosperity, holiness and happiness has reigned across the globe for a thousand years. Folks have been treated flawlessly. And yet the people who populate the planet are still sinners at heart, aren't they? Like men today, they're born with a sin nature. With Jesus on the throne, they've lived by his rules. They're better for it, certainly. But they've only conformed to an external standard. They haven't been transformed by the Holy Spirit. These people need to be born again. And this reality doesn't hit home until Satan is let loose for a reason. It's for a season. For all of a sudden, those people are confronted with a choice. They're tempted. Who needs God anyway? I can make my own rules. I can be my own God. Ever heard that before? That's the lie Satan spawned in the garden. It started in Eden. But the people at the end of the age will be hearing it for the first time. And sadly, it will inflame the rebellious nature that's been simmering inside them. Even after a thousand years in a perfect world... Humans will still rebel. Why? Because it is their nature to do so. And here God proves for all time that humans have sin in their heart. The old adage is true. Sinning doesn't make you a sinner. You sin because you are a sinner. Selfishness and rebellion are embedded in human nature. And what happens at the end of the millennium proves that the heart of man's problem is the problem in his heart. Mankind is a rebel by nature. Well, verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. This flimsy coup d'etat dares to lay siege to Jesus' capital city. This is the final insurrection. How dare anyone attack Jesus after he's been so good? And the revolt is put down in short order. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And now the instigator finally gets his just due. Verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You remember Jesus told us, he told his disciples that the lake of fire wasn't created for human beings, but for Satan and his demons. And here, Satan is sent to his ultimate destination. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. And what an ominous sight this will be. White is the color of holiness and purity. A throne speaks of great authority. And great has the sound of permanence and sovereignty. I believe it's Jesus Christ who sits on this throne. We learn in verse 12, this is the throne of judgment. And you recall the long list of people who judged Jesus while he was on earth. You remember he stood before Caiaphas the priest. Herod the king. The Jewish Sanhedrin. Rome's Governor Pontius Pilate, even the mob who screamed, crucify him, crucify him. Now imagine each of them now appearing at this throne to be judged by Jesus. Boy, the roles are going to be reversed. There's going to be a lot of squirming going on at the great white throne of judgment. The reason folks appear here is because they rejected Jesus and they judged him as unfit to follow. And now it will be Jesus' turn to judge them and see how they stack up to God's righteousness. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. You know, after a thousand years of renovations, after renewing all that sin had worn out, God decides to ditch the earth in this physical universe and start brand new. And why would God do that? (laughs) Well, I don't pretend to know all his reasons. But perhaps he does want us to know that this world 
and all that's in it has simply been a stage. That stuff that we valued have been just props and just symbols. That what truly matters are the things that will last forever. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 tells us of this future inferno. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Physics teaches us that like charges repel. And yet at the atom center is a cluster of bonded protons. They all have the same charge. And scientists can't explain this. They they sometimes try to explain the mystery with terms like atomic glue, whatever that is, or the God particle. Their understanding is vague, but the Bible is quite clear as to what's going on. Colossians 1 verse 17 says that in Christ all things consist or literally hold together. This world is in the hands of Jesus, and one day... He's just going to let go. And the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. A meltdown is coming. In that day, all that will be left will be man and his maker. Then everyone in the bottomless pit, all unbelievers from all the ages, every rebel who rejected God's salvation will stand before Jesus and answer for their decision. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, rich and poor, noted and, you know, unworthy. All the dead, great and small, standing before God. And books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. These books must contain every deed ever done. And at the great white throne of judgment, all will be exposed. Nothing will remain hidden. Every person who rejected Christ will be judged by their own deeds, the merits that they mustered. We've installed... Security cameras all around the building here. We had a new employee this week. He came in for his orientation, and I told him, I said, now make sure when you walk out in the hall, be careful you don't pick your nose or scratch where you don't want to be seen. We got cameras everywhere around here. And I hope you know God's got his cameras everywhere. Every deed done, every thought thunk is being recorded. One day we'll be exposed. Realize the four judgments that we find in Scripture. First is the judgment that occurred on the cross. On Calvary, in the person of Jesus, God judged our sin once and for all. The punishment due us was taken out on Jesus. He bore our judgment so that God could forgive us. That means that when you trust Jesus, your sin is judged forever. Second is the judgment seat or the bema seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, we find there that the issue is not our sin, but our service. This will be where the believer's works are judged to see what reward we'll receive. Our motivation will be tested. Good deeds done out of love for God will be valued as gold and silver, but service done out of pride or out of selfishness will be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. Third is the judgment of the nations. This occurs at Jesus' second coming in the valley of Jehoshaphat, just outside of Jerusalem. Joel 3 and Matthew 25 tell us that Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. How the nations treated God's kids, Israel, will be the criteria for their judgment. And then the fourth judgment is the great white throne of judgment that we find here. This is not for believers. In Revelation 4, believers gather around a multicolored throne. It's represented, that represented by, as God's grace, manifold grace. And it's surrounded by a rainbow, a symbol of his faithfulness. And four living creatures, each representing a different aspect of Jesus' ministry, shout holy, holy, holy. That's the throne that we'll gather around. What a contrast here, though. This throne is large and looming. It's stark white. It's intimidating. For it represents God's unapproachable holiness. 
unforgiven sinners, beware. If you're in Christ, your sin has been judged at the cross. But notice folks under scrutiny here are judged according to their works. And the last thing you want, friend, is to stand before God on the merit of your own works. I mean, who else but Jesus lived a good enough life to please a sinless, holy God? Don't dare try to stand before God and think you'll get accepted by your works. Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that in God's sight, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. If judged according to my effort, I'm in big trouble. You are too. I'm resting not in my works, but in the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Verse 13. Well, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Hades opens up its hatches and all the unbelieving dead are condemned before God. Nobody stands a chance. Romans 3 verse 23 will be the verdict. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now remember, Hades is like the county jail. It's the temporary holding. It's where the spirits of unbelievers are today. In Luke 16, the rich man suffers in the flames of Hades. But it's not the permanent punishment. Gehenna, or the lake of fire, is the supermax prison. The lake of fire is the final assignment. Once you're found lacking at the great white throne, you're then sent to the lake. And despite popular lore... There are no keg parties there. There are no wild orgies in hell. You're going to find none of your beer buddies down at the lake of fire. All you're going to find is fire and brimstone. You're going to find scorching regret. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. Physical death is the first death. But the lake... This eternal damnation is the second. There's an old saying, born once, die twice. But born twice, die once. Come to Jesus. Be born again. And you'll face only physical death. First death is not the one to fear. The second death is the lake of fire. And chapter 20 closes, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I would suggest here is the most pressing question you'll ever be asked. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you trust in the cross of Christ, or do you trust in your own merits? There are really only two futures, the garden or the fire.